The House Energy Communications and Technology Committee will come to order. Madam Clerk, will you please call the roll? Chair Scott? Present. Representatives Andrews? Here. Coleman? Here. Whitsitt? Neely? Here. Burns? Here. Churches? Present. Hill? Here. McDonald? Here. McFall? Here. Wenzel? Here. Altman? Aragona? Here. McGoal? Here. Green? Here. Preston? Here. Schmaltz? Here. And I'm sure you have 15 members, you have a quorum. Okay, thank you. Um, Rep Hill makes a motion to adapt the minutes from the June 7th meeting. All right, today we will hear testimony on Senate Bills 302 and 303, uh, sponsored by Senator McDonald Rivet. Um, Senator, will you please come forward? Thank you very much, good morning. Uh, I'm grateful to be here and thank Chair Scott and the members of the committee for the opportunity to testify on Senate Bill 303 and with your permission, also testify on Senate Bill 302, which is Senator Camilleri's bill. Absolutely. They, they come together. So this legislation is uh, an expansion of the current scope of eligible projects for the property under the Commercial Property Assessed Clean Energy Programs, or CPACE. So let me just start by offering a little bit of background on what CPACE is. It essentially authorizes local units of government to adopt or create districts that promote energy efficiency. It's typically through county governments, but cities also have the ability to do this if they choose, and it's within their jurisdiction. The first step really is for a commercial property owner to contract with a third party administrator that approves a contract. The current eligible properties under the law are only commercial and industrial, and these two bills would add agricultural lands. Once eligible properties so secure financing, an independent energy audit or modeling is conducted. The authorizing unit of government must adopt a resolution, hold a public hearing, and then construction begins. So essentially what it does is helps provide a source of capital from the private sector to fund advanced energy efficiency projects as within projects within commercial properties. Repayment for the project is through an assessment on the property for a negotiated number of years. So the CPACE program has been really successfully operating in Michigan for over a decade to help businesses make valuable energy saving investments, often uh, beyond what is, uh, what is considered um, a code around energy efficiency. So this is, this is a unique program. I was very interested in um, sponsoring the expansion of it because it is pro-business economic development tool that uses 100% private capital and creates zero liability for state or local governments. Today, it has enabled 67 projects across the state and resulted in $332 million in energy savings. So Senate Bill 302, which is Senator Camilleri's bill, expands Michigan CPACE market and the Michigan CPACE market and increases the scope of projects that can access this important source of funding. Commercial property owners will be able to better leverage commercial PACE financing for investments that improve efficiency and lower their carbon footprint. Borrowers re renovating existing buildings will be able to waive the current energy savings guarantee requirement and enable funding for projects that are beneficial and cost effective over the long term. My bill also ensures that these bills also, this bill also ensures that new projects are energy efficient by requiring them to exceed current energy code. Senate Bill 303 would add water usage improvements and environmental hazard projects to eligible projects for commercial property broaden the definition of energy efficiency improvements, and include the eligibility of agricultural lands. CPACE is an optional tool for local municipalities to offer to their commercial property owners. It has measures to ensure transparency and consumer protections, which includes an independent energy audit or modeling, a guarantee of investment to savings ratio, and a requirement for a public hearing and approval on all projects. As our state continues to work to mitigate the effects of PFAS, lead, heavy metals, floods, and severe weather, this is legislation that provides a tool for property owners to secure their business in an economical way that achieves savings and creates no liability for local governments. So I just want to thank the committee for taking these bill bills up today and happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Um, uh, Chair recognizes Representative Altman. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, 
So you mentioned zero liability for local units of government. Where in the bill does it say that exactly? Where does it say zero liability? It's that's actually the um, the bill doesn't say zero liability. The impact of the bill is zero liability. But if they default on those payments and the property tax payments of the loan, doesn't it fall back on the taxpayers? It goes to the third party administrator. Okay. Is that how all PACE programs are set up? Because in, in California, which uh, I, I don't know, I think was a kind of ahead of the curve in a lot of these programs, there have been cases of default where it w did fall back on the local taxpayers. You're yeah. saying that there's zero chance of that happening within these bills? So what I would actually, uh, so that that is my understanding uh, and the research that I have done, but we also, coming behind me, are our uh, industry experts on the PACE program, and um, I'm happy to move to get further information to your office, but would invite you to ask the, the more detailed technical questions to the stakeholders. Okay. Thank you. Um, Chair recognizes Representative Hill. I'll just hold my questions till we get to the, um, I'm, uh, to the folks who have the more details. Thank you. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Any more questions? Um, I'm sorry, Representative Preston. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah, my question is, why are we feeling the need to surpass the currently set construction codes? Um, yeah. You know, when, when we're encompassing things like multi-unit, multi multi-family unit projects, um, projects that are already in the works, and the materials, project materials that are, that are incredibly expensive, why are we going above and beyond what's already in the code? Yeah, I think that that's a really important question. So thank you for, thank you for asking that. So here's what's important about the PACE program. It is not required, right? It's not something that, um, that, that the state is imposing on development, which would be a problem right now, right? We have, um, I have a, a, um, many developments going on in my district, as I'm sure you do as well. Uh, what this is an optional program that helps provide financing for projects that wanna go above and beyond. So if you, if you are looking to be ahead of the curve, you wanna make a uh, further progress on car carbon footprint, this provides a tool to do that, but is not a requirement. But are we, are we exposing taxpayer money on the local level or on the state level um, to these projects and, and the necessity for it, considering how, how short we are in housing and in project development period? So this, so here's what's important is that this bill, so this program already exists and has funded uh, many projects across the state. This is expanding eligibility. We actually had farmers coming to us asking for uh, the ability to use this tool. It's an economic development tool. It is not a state requirement. Uh, but when we think about the, uh, the digesters that uh, farms are using in order to reduce carbon, those are not required. A lot of farmers want to do it really expensive uh, and beyond what they're capable of doing. So what we're looking to do is to expand a program that is already shown to be successful for years in Michigan and make it available in particular for our farmers that will finding that kind of capital to make those investments is really difficult. So this, this provides them a tool to do that. They aren't required to. And it's also important to note, local municipalities are not required to use this tool, but it's a tool and as many tools as we can have in our tool belt to not only help development, but also look at addressing climate change and pull those two things together when we're using private capital and market forces to drive these kinds of, uh, these kind of goals that I think that we all share. I think it's a, it's, um, that, that that is where sound policy exists. And I'll close with this. My, my only worry is, and, and we have a digester in, in my district, and I know the family real well, is that it, this is gonna push project costs up. Um, this digester already exists prior to this legislate this proposed legislation and I'm just worried about the the, the uptick in project costs um, that are already in the pipeline and people that wish to move down that road. Yeah, thank I you. think we always need to be worried about that. So thank you for the concern representative. I don't think that we have any evidence that suggests that that's the case. Chair recognizes minority vice chair Wenzel. Hello, um, so speaking of digesters, why are we changing the definition? Why is that necessary? in your bill? The industry asked for it, but the specifics, I, I, I will confess to you, I'm not an expert in the specifics of the definition of the digesters, uh, but it is, uh, but uh, I, 
I can get that to you, but it, it's it's a it was a re at request of the industry. I was just uh, take I just a couple days ago I took a tour of new digesters going up in Southwest Michigan. They're fascinating, but it's unfortunate that they're not able to use them at full capacity because of Deagle and pain that they are being. But anyways, um, also I can't speak to that. <laughs> I know. Um, so why is you know we're we're talking about energy efficiency here? So why is natural gas not included? Why is natural gas not included in, in these bills? I mean. The way I read so them. Help me understand not. your question more. Where would you where would you want to have that? It, I mean, it's just we're it's, talking about energy standards that applies across the board. It's just not included in these bills in any way. I don't know why we're not talking about natural gas when it has a ninety two percent efficiency. So when you see the language that refers to existing energy code, that's going to apply across the board. There's not a draw out. There's not a um, what's the word I'm looking for? Specific statement around different sources of energy. Uh, so uh, I think the assumption would be that it would apply across the board. Chair recognizes Representative Schwartz. I guess, I guess what, uh, on the same vein, is your definition of renewable energy. Um, uh, you know, you cite methane from landfills and digesters, but why exclude, like, nuclear or biomass generation? You know, why generators, why? Well, because local commercial project properties are not going to uh, include things like nuclear energy in local individual project uh, um projects, right? So that that is something that we have to talk about in the grid and I understand, you know, I serve on the energy committee in the Senate as well. There are there are conversations we have to have about what renewable energy sources that we're talking about as we try to move toward them, but that is not germane to what this bill is doing. So you don't think the definition should be expanded? I I I would not support an expansion of that in this bill at this time, no. Any more questions? Representative Green. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Senator, for coming. So if certain municipalities participate this and others don't, then do you think that would create a disparity in housing prices because it increases the price of houses in certain districts or certain communities and not others? Yes, my staff looked at that. I, I just have to tell you, it's so hard for me to get used to so many of you. <laughs> in the Senate, we're so much smaller. I, you know, I think that... I, how did every single one of us, I'm just going to speak for all of us, have hearing in our districts worry about housing prices. And it's something that we should consider with everything that we do. This project, this uh, CPACE has been around for a very long time, and we have not seen evidence of it causing that issue in the past. So I don't have any reason to believe that the expansion, particularly into agricultural land, is going to have an impact on housing costs. Chair recognizes Representative Hill. I do have a question. Uh, one of the unique things about PACE is that it extends the, p the, time, the loan time frames. And that was going to be my technical question, but if you, I, I think that's a really important um, point to bring up is that what, by definition, energy waste reduction is lowering the cost of operations. So while there may be, it's one of those classic problems where there's an initial greater cost, but the operations will then reduce greatly over time so that in the long term, and certainly with farms in particular, we're looking at long, long term payback uh, because f uh, we want those farms to continue. So I think the, the, the hi what we might want to consider is both the, the length of time that these are, are available, uh, the, 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 the terms of the loan are longer. Yeah. S and then also with the cost of operations going down, it th th there's an incredible savings that's provided there. Could you speak on that, please? Yeah, I think that's a really important point. I, I what I'd say is I've run businesses. I've been a part of very major multi-million dollar builds of facilities. There's this space where you want to do something, but it's an upfront, th this notion of upfront costs that then um, you recoup over a number of years is a beautiful thing in theory, but not always when you're trying to raise the capital for, for development. And so that is, that is I think, what makes this, this special and why, frankly, it's critically important that we make it available to everyone in the state. Because um, there are so many, you know, in, in my district, you know, once, once you get north, this, that's agricultural land, and that's 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 where I, that's where I live. We have to be able to make these tools available across the board, and the ability to um, make it more advantageous for private capital to come in and help with that. So as you so you get a longer runway to recoup your costs, is is just incredibly important. So ag agree with you. And any way that we can make that stronger would be um, would be uh, is something I would support. 
Any further questions? No. Senator, thank you so much for your testimony. I appreciate it. Um, we do have additional testimony. Um, I want to call forward Justin Carpenter from Michigan EIBC. Hi, thank you. You may proceed. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. My name is Justin Carpenter. I'm the Director of Policy at the Michigan Energy Innovation Business Council. This is Laura Sherman, our president. Um, we are a trade organization of around 160 advanced energy companies ranging anywhere from rooftop solar to General Motors. Uh, we are pretty much invested in any kind of energy issue. Um, when it comes to uh, CPACE projects, we have everything from the administer administrators, the developers. Um, we are actually lucky to have several of our members on Zoom today. So uh, with your permission, Madam Chair, I'll defer kind of some of the technical questions to them. I might be able to land in the fairway, but uh, they can actually hit the pin. So <laughs> I will uh, kind of punt to them on this. But uh, we are obviously very supportive of this language. Um, this is not the first time that these bills have come through. Uh, Rep Outman, Rep Scott, you might recognize these as 5011 and 5012 from last term. Uh, which pa passed through this committee with bipartisan support. Um, yeah, these are fantastic opportunities to kind of build more energy efficient projects in commercial buildings, um, and we are fully supportive of them. Um, with your permission, Madam Chair, I'd like to kind of defer some of the questions to uh, Todd Williams. <laughs> I understand, no problem. Okay, so we do have um, on Zoom Todd Williams from Lean and Green, Michigan. You can stay there if you want to. Good morning, and, and can you hear me? Yes, thank you. I'm sorry. Yes, proceed. Excellent. Thank, thank you for having me and allowing me to testify remotely. I'm actually on vacation this week, so apologies for the polo. I did not pack a dress shirt with me. So, but my name is Todd Williams. I'm President and General Counsel of Lean and Green Michigan Republic Private Partnership, which jointly administers the Commercial Property Assessed Energy Program on behalf of the 54 local governments around Michigan, including 32 counties and 22 cities and townships, and representing roughly 74% of the population in Michigan. Uh, our role is, is really to make CPACE easy, easy for our jurisdictions to implement, easy for commercial property owners to take advantage of, and easy for Michigan contractors and CPACE lenders to use. We serve as experts on the Michigan Pay Statute and on behalf of our member jurisdictions. We help all parties involved complete the CPACE financing transaction and ensure compliance with the statute. CPACE projects use private capital to improve Michigan properties, creating jobs, promoting economic development, and building better buildings. These projects incentivize cost effective sustainability by retrofitting existing buildings and encouraging energy efficient new construction buildings. From our start in 2012 and our first project, which was financed in 2015, we've assisted with financing of 70 CPACE projects, representing investment over 233 million. A slight change, uh, the, the difference in the numbers from uh, Senator McDonald Rivet and mine are the fact that we closed three projects last week. So she did not see the updated numbers yet. But um, I will say, you know, this represents $233 million of investment in Michigan. 11 of those projects uh, representing investment at 12 million can be found in your districts. The, the Cambridge Court Apartments in Greenville is actually the first PACE project in the nation, which also involved USDA funding and added a 20 kilowatt solar system, LED lighting, low flow plumbing, and upgraded HVAC to improve the apartment complex, which was already there. Um, the Upper Decker project, one of my favorites, is located in downtown Escanaba, the first PACE project in the UP a simple project consisting of improving the roof and adding a rooftop solar system, and it should pay for itself in roughly 5.3 years. PACE is applicable to all types of commercial properties and used by all types of commercial property owners. We've built a vibrant and growing CPACE market, and with steady growth, the footprint of CPACE across Michigan, success of each project is getting further success. Yet the current Michigan statute is one of the most restrictive in the nation. The amendments to the statute before you offer common sense updates to our statute. In particular, the amendment allowing commercial property owners to waive the savings to investment requirements and energy savings guarantee has been in line with most frequent requests I receive from property owners. 
making this requirement waivable for retrofit and environmental hazard projects empowers commercial property owners to determine the level of protection they want. I think it's important to remember that many of these are property owners that are often sophisticated, represented by legal and financial advisors. They're well positioned to understand the costs, benefits, and risks associated with this type of project financing. The clarification around new construction projects, removing the requirement for an annual SIR requirement, facilitates the use of CPACE, encouraging new commercial property owners to be built above code while helping property owners access additional capital. Due to the current SIR requirement, all new construction CPACE projects have been built above code, but we've seen other projects which would have otherwise been built and more, otherwise would have built a more efficient building fail to meet the SIR and lose the ability to access based financing. Thank you for your time. Happy to address any questions you may have, uh, including the one about zero liability, if you want me to start there. Thank you so much for your testimony. Do we have any questions? Representative Altman. Thanks again, Madam Chair, and thank you, sir, for being here to testify. Um, you, you did mention uh, the project in Greenville that's within my district, and so we, hop, we opted in at the very beginning, back when they passed this around 2012 or whenever it was, it was quite a while ago. But uh, you, you did touch on it. So my question is, there's zero chance that default payments could fall back on taxpayers. Now, uh, I'm an attorney, so I always hate, you know, any anytime I'm trying to say zero liability, I, I will say the, the way the program is structured, uh, the way that the, the agreements are all structured, you know, it is in, in extremely remote risk that it would ever fall back onto the taxpayers. And, and let me go through a little bit of it. You know, these are private loans. Uh, one of the lenders will be speaking after me, you know, pepper him with any question you want about underwriting, but I guarantee you they are just as hard to get a loan out of as anybody else. Um, from a statutory position, you know, we, we take a look at each project. Each local jurisdiction is going to take a look at each project as well. Each one has to come back for approval. Mm -hmm. uh, we have very high requirements from an underwriting perspective and a technical perspective. But the, the biggest hook, you know, included at the, the end of the day, each project, when it gets funded, has underlying financing agreements and a special assessment agreement, which is executed with the local jurisdiction, the lender, and the commercial property owner. Buried within that agreement, is a provision designed to protect uh, the local so, jurisdiction. So, sir, if I could just if, if I could just interject, this is a very attorney-like yep. way to answer this question. Is there a chance that this could fall right. back on taxpayers? You, it sounds like you um, don't know the answer to that question. I, I would say no. You know, worst-case scenario, uh, a property default and uh, go through the three-year-long foreclosure process like any other tax assessment, and the property does not sell and falls to the county. We've included provisions within the agreement that the lenders have to agree to that the jurisdiction is never going to make a payment to them for this special assessment. It will sit on the property in perpetuity, and it will not be paid by taxpayer money. Okay. I'll yield back to the chair. Thank you. Thank you. Um, any more questions? No? Okay. Um, thank you for so much for your testimony. Um, we do have additional support uh, that will be speaking on Zoom. Nicholas Zumba from CPACE Alliance. Great. Thank you so much. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you. Great. Thank you so much, uh, Chairwoman Scott, and to the entire uh, House Energy Com Communications and Technology Committee uh, for the opportunity to speak before you today about the proposed bills of SB 302 and 303. So again, my name is Nicholas Zuba. I'm Deputy Director of CPACE Alliance, in which case my organization is a nonprofit trade association where we promote and institute uh, the best practices with the design and implementation of CPACE programs. We've been responsible for helping to develop or enhance um, uh, basically over 20 programs nationally. And through this all, we represent the key interests of uh, particular stakeholder groups, which include CPACE capital provider firms like that of my colleague, Bali Kumar, who will talk to you shortly, and as well as also law firms who are responsible for the creation and funding of these CPACE projects nationally. So I'm appearing before your committee today, though, to speak on behalf of our organization's membership to support the passage of both SB 302 and 303. The purpose of the two bills um, is to help modernize the Michigan CPACE program uh, by m amending the Property Assessed Clean Energy Act to come into alignment with industry developments that have been seen over the past few years. 
And namely, of course, this includes the uh, enabling Michigan's program to be able to finance additional types of projects, which include new construction energy projects, environmental hazard projects, or kind of resiliency, as probably you would hear probably in other states, and as well as water usage improvements. Now, this ensures that both newly constructed and as well as existing properties uh, could be made even more sustainable and also be better protected from climatic uh, conditions that uh, that we're seeing uh, here in the planet of late, of late, you know, whether it be drought, fires, or any kind of other kind of uh, flooding type uh, conditions as well. And then these bills also will help to enable more comprehensive and deeper improvement projects to be financed um, by making both the savings to investment ratio or SIR and savings guarantee voluntary because uh, SIR, while it's well intentioned, mm -hmm. the bottom line is that it creates an artificial barrier, though, to creating and basically financing more of these uh, sort of more comprehensive uh, energy type projects. Um, and so basically under uh, SB 302, it would enable a property owner to be able to waive that requirement and be able then to get uh, a more comprehensive uh, project to be uh, instituted and financed so that they can garner even more economic savings while also further reducing their buildings, energy and water usage at the same time. And of course, there is precedent for uh, this type of requirement, the SIR requirement, um, having either been relaxed or also even removed in its entirety, um, basically um, in those states that did have those uh, requirements in place. And that includes in a neighboring uh, Wisconsin and then out west in Nevada and as well as Alaska. Put together these changes uh, will help bring Michigan CPA's program again into sort of alignment and with seeing the developments um, that we've had um, in the programs that have been developed more of late. Um, these changes will only help to build upon Michigan CPA's program success that's been seen to date, uh, which has been touched on. And most importantly, opening up CPACE uh, to be used on these added types of projects will help to basically drive even more uh, private investment and creating even more jobs in the state, thereby increasing these economic development opportunities that we can have here in the state of Michigan, so that all that, that can be done in this case will then also help uh, make the state even more sustainable and resilient um, in the years to come. So with that, again, the CPACE Alliance and our membership supports the passage of both SB 302 and 303, and we're urging this committee to act swiftly on their passage so we can bring these policy uh, improvements to the Michigan CPACE program as soon as possible. So thank you very much, and thank you for your attention today. Thank you for your testimony. Um, we do have questions. Representative Hill. Hello. Uh, thank you for your testimony and laying out so clearly what uh, the potential benefits are. I was hoping we could also talk some more about the water uh, improvements that would be possible. I'm thinking about the tremendous amount of water that gets used on a farm and um, and how the um, being able to save water would save them money and also put potentially protect them from other uh, costs uh, that might happen as they're more and more concerned about different contaminants. Could you speak to the, the how the water you know, improvements uh, add to this program and really add a significant savings to operations of different companies, including farms. Oh, oh there we go. <laughs> um, yes, thank you so much for your question, uh, Legislator. Um, so basically, at the end of the day, um, you know, with regard to water improvements, I mean, the way I think normally it'd be thought about is strictly reducing its consumption, as opposed to, I think, being more involved with uh, helping with water quality in this case and making those kinds of improvements. But again, the discretion obviously is going to come um, at the programmatic level once the legislation passes to determine, I think, what exactly would fall under as being allowable improvements or the types of allowable improvements for basically improving on uh, water usage uh, in this case and reducing consumption, or if in fact quality can in fact be uh, something that can be addressed and improved um, with regard to uh, that, that those types of improvements. But yeah, basically then the discretion I think would come um, when Todd and his team in this case would basically update their guidelines and then make a determination about what kinds of actual improvements could actually be covered under water usage. But, but I could say normally um, in other programs across the country, I don't believe quality has ever been addressed as being a, a CPACE financeable type of opportunity, but really more just reducing um, the actual amount of consumption of water usage uh, is normally a bit within how basically that, that's been implemented in other states. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Chair recognizes Representative Preston. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you for testifying today. Um, 
There seems to be a lot of subjectivity as the outcome of this legislation, but with the intense need to build capacity in both housing and, and energy, why advocate for stricter code than currently exists and add layers of code and red tape to that are proven barriers to project development? How does this legislation improve project outcome? I, I see it as, a, if anything, more red tape that slows down project outcomes. Um, we as a state are definitely behind and need to build capacity sooner than later. Yes, well, thank you very much so much for the question, uh, Representative. I mean, the bottom line is that I think this particular, these particular changes actually helps to remove barriers, not add barriers, frankly, to basically getting projects done um, so that we can get as many of these projects financed and then implemented as soon as possible. Because again, take for example, allowing now a property owner in this case to be able to waive uh, things like the SIR requirement and savings guarantee yeah, those were once hurdles that you had to get over um, in order to be able to qualify getting CPACE financing put into a CPACE project. Um, now those can be waived, and now you can move even quicker now to get uh, a CPACE finance project approved, and then as well as then move to the stage of implementation. So um, I I would actually disagree and, and think that actually there's uh, making this program a little bit more streamlined. And it's actually helping in this case to get, I think, even more projects done um, quicker. And even too, it's expanding, obviously, as we, I've mentioned, it's getting even more projects done too, um, that now newly constructed buildings can benefit from this, where they can get CPACE financing into the capital stack of a construction project. And that simply, they just got to meet um, basically then the code of the state um, in order to be able to unlock getting uh, CPACE financing uh, for basically that particular project. I think those are pretty easy hurdles, I think, to, to get over. And I don't think that it would, in fact, um, increase red tape or even uh, draw, drag out the process. Just to redirect, though, my, my question was, was regarding the code requirements themselves, not the things that you cited regarding streamlining of the process. The code requirements are going to add an additional layer to the, to the, the builders or project developers trying to meet a two-tiered system, one with a baseline construction code and now this enhanced construction code. Um, well, at this point, I mean, I, I really can't, I think, comment very specifically on, you know, basically the code requirements, if there's been kind of any additions. But, I mean, to me, you know, codes that are in place, you know, properties, uh, developers in this case will have to build to those anyway, um, especially with respect to at least the energy codes in this case. Um, those are already in place. And if they're having to already design a building in order to get their permits in this case to be able then to build um, in that particular place, they're going to have to meet these codes anyway. Um, so I don't, again, think that it's necessarily CPACE is adding any additional barrier. It's simply saying, too, if you basically design the building to meet these codes, the bottom lines, then you can get the CPACE financing to be included in the project. So bottom line is that, uh, you know, again, this is just something if they have to meet it, um, you know, they'll, they'll have to probably meet it anyway because they got to get a permit to be able to build the building. And this now, that's just a way to qualify them to get CPACE financing within uh, the Michigan CPACE program. Thank you. All right. Well, we appreciate your testimony. Uh, any more questions? No? All right. Thank you so much for your presentation in support of the bill. Thank you. You're welcome. Also on Zoom, we have Bally Kumar from PACE Loan Group that's in support of the bill as well. Good morning. Thank you for your time today. I just want to check everyone can hear me. Yes, we can proceed. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your time. I'm here to testify in support as well. I think that these bills clean up, clarify and bring in line with national best practice, the pay statute in Michigan. Um, and over time in every state, every state is always working to perfect their pay statute. And so this is a step in that direction. We at Pace Loan Group, uh, my name is Bali Kumar. I'm the Chief Operating Officer of Pace Loan Group. We are a private lender, and we're happy to participate in this public-private partnership to assist in the financing of renovations of existing buildings, adaptive reuse of certain shuttered properties. We've dealt with a lot of properties where we financed across Michigan where the property is sitting vacant and someone wants to transform it from what it used to be into something that is useful. Uh, oftentimes housing. We recently closed three projects in Southeast Michigan where they were vacant buildings and they were changed into by means of a very complicated capital stack, including PACE. 
uh, into naturally occurring affordable housing. And so really the PACE program allows people to access financing that they otherwise can't. So in this project, in these projects, for instance, they had to bring together a lot of sources of capital to the table in order to make the deal pencil, especially for naturally occurring affordable housing. It's not like these developers are making lots of money. So they need to bring in the cheapest sources of capital possible. And PACE is after banks, oftentimes the cheapest source of capital. And so this is why people are willing to ensure that their project complies with the PACE statute. Oftentimes, you know, sometimes people want the energy efficiency, but other times people just want their building to pencil because they want the cheaper financing that we provide and they know that they will achieve the operational savings on the back end. Um, we, as the capital provider, we bear the risk of repayment. And this is why we have very strict underwriting standards. Uh, we really ensure that what they're projecting as their financials to us work, because if we don't get paid back, we just have to sit and wait until another property owner takes over the property and then eventually pays us back. So there's no risk to the local governments of non-payment in all of our agreements. There's a clause that says in the event of foreclosure that the local government doesn't make any payments to us. We just have to sit and wait until we get our next payment from whoever the next property owner is. Um, also, I, I just wanted to be responsive to anything about housing. Uh, we will finance multifamily projects, but the legislation doesn't allow for homes to take on PACE financing. So I think that is uh, a null point, uh, but we really do finance a lot of affordable multifamily projects. So I think this is another way that we help uh, building stock in the state. Um, the point on SIR, uh, I totally understand that uh, there's code and anyone who's building above code sort of qualifies for this PACE financing, which is helpful because it's cheaper financing than going to mezzanine debt or going to raise PREF equity. Like that's their alternative to PACE. And that alternative is 15% interest or like 20% required returns. So that's why people sort of opt into the PACE program because they achieve the operational savings, but also because it's cheaper capital. And I guess I'll leave it there for any questions. Thanks for your time. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, Chair recognizes Representative Hill. Hello. I um, I'm, It was um, great to hear about cheaper capital. That's something we almost never hear about uh, these days. Uh, you also used a phrase I'm not familiar with, um, naturally occurring affordable housing. Um, is that like when I plant my um, my native plants, or uh, or is there? Uh, could you please explain that uh, that term? I'm very very intrigued. Is it? So yeah, I guess it's like milkweed. Is my is my question? <laughs> a lot of affordable housing is uh, ha has to meet certain requirements to achieve certain uh, maybe light tech or certain uh, types of financing that's government provided, and some developers choose not to go through all those hoops because it's pretty difficult, uh, but instead they can find a property that they can make the numbers work just using regular private financing and still be able to offer rents that are affordable or deeply affordable. Thank you. Any more questions? No? Okay, we appreciate your testimony today. Thank you so very much. Um, also in support of the bill, who present, who's present in the room, Ed Rivett from the Michigan Conservative Energy Forum. If you can come forward, thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Uh, first disclaimer is uh, Conservative Energy Forum supported this legislation before my sister-in-law sponsored it. Uh, and I'll put that into context that in fact one of the most important points I wanted to make about uh, this legislation is that it did pass this committee last session under the 
uh, chairmanship of uh, now Senator Bellino and approved by a Republican majority of the committee. So this is really bipartisan supported legislation. I wanted to put that context in place along with the fact that it came about during the Snyder administration more than a decade ago. And as you've heard, has been very successfully uh, implemented in our state, but it's been over 10 years and it needs some upgrading. Uh, I think it's important, uh, I want to stress as well from our conservative energy uh, forum perspective, the support this would provide for agribusiness. We call them farms, but they're businesses. They're extremely complicated businesses that have enormous energy costs. And this is a financing mechanism that would be expanded to one of the most important business sectors in our state that they currently don't have access to. So that is a critical point. Um, I had some other testimony things that I was going to say, but I think I'd rather address the issues and questions that have been raised to this point. Um, in particular, uh, uh, Representative Preston, your concern about building above code. There's, first of all, the, the program was designed initially as primarily retrofitting businesses that wanted to save money where they were previously inefficient. So the idea is the financing of a project you had to show that you were gonna save more money than the investment in the process, in the, in the project. That's what the savings to investment ratio is about, the SIR that you hear about. Well, if we're going to extend this now to new builds or expansions of businesses that currently exist, we'd wanna still make sure that that investment is gonna pay for itself. So building above code is part of the logic of that. With regard to housing, especially, especially affordable housing, um, low-income housing, what's critical about building above code is it will be cheaper to live there, right? Because the, your, your operational expenses will go down. It'll be cheaper to heat it or cool it in the summer and more efficient lighting, more efficient water. So building above code is a penny saved, penny earned strategy. And that's why, uh, it's again, it's an option, but it's a valuable one. It makes dollars and cents. As I mentioned, Governor Snyder was a big proponent of this because there was no one more fixated on businesses saving money than, than Governor Snyder. That's why he supported this law uh, coming into effect back in the day. So um, for all of those reasons, um, and again, I, I want to emphasize uh, the support for the agricultural community accessing this. And I also want to point out that there is, there has not, unless Mr. Williams or someone can correct me, in the 10 years plus of this program, there's not been a single default. It's worked for everybody who's used it. And if there is a default, as has been noted, they just don't... The, the money comes through uh, a payment on their, right, it's assessment on their taxes. When the taxes are paid, then the loan, the lender gets their share of that payment. If they're not paying their taxes, then the lender doesn't get their share. So uh, there hasn't been a default and there isn't a risk to the taxpayer. So um, we just think that it's uh, an excellent time after a decade plus to upgrade this and to leverage all these advantages. Uh, and I would certainly encourage uh, the committee to support the bills as, as this committee did uh, last session. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Any questions? No? All right. Thank you so very much for your testimony then. We appreciate it. I'm going to read in the cards of support for bills 302 and 303. We have Logan Vorse, the Michigan League of Conservation, of Conservation, voters, okay. Also in support of the bill, we have uh, Jason Hayes from the Mackinac Center for Public Policy. Who won't, they won't be speaking today. Um, in support of the bill, not wishing to speak, will be Carly Knott from the Michigan Environmental Council. And also in support of the bill not willing to speak today, Travis Boskel from uh, the Department of Environmental Lake, uh, Lakes and Energy Eagle. Okay. All right. Um, we're also going to take up testimony on Senate Bill 288, sponsored by Senator Singh. Um, if you could come forward, uh, Senator. Thank you very much, Madam Chair and members of the committee for uh, taking up uh, testimony on Senate Bill 288. Uh, the Senate Bill 288 is the elimination 
of the sunset on the Michigan Energy Assistance Program. This uh, initiative has been in place for over a decade. It was uh, instituted in 2013 under uh, the previous um, administration. Uh, and this was focused to help low-income households receive uh, energy bill assistance through payment or partial payment of bills for electricity, natural gas, propane, heating oil, and other deliverable fuels that used to heat uh, somebody's home. The great part of this program is not only does it help people pay their bills, but the nonprofits that administer this also then work with those families to do budgeting and other types of things to be able to help them manage their long-term uh, energy costs. So it's not just let's help somebody with the immediate need, it's also helping them doing their budgeting and, and financing uh, for this. Uh, we don't have um, uh, data from this last year, but from the 21-22 winter season, more than 40,000 households from all 83 counties uh, utilized uh, assistance through here. There was over $50 million distributed of energy assistance to keep the lights on and furnaces on in homes uh, throughout uh, the state. Uh, the last sunset uh, was uh, extended back in 2019. It passed the Senate 38 nothing and it passed the House 109 to zero. So obviously there's a lot of support uh, for this. And the question is, now is the time, now after a decade of, uh, of implementation, that we shouldn't be coming back every three years uh, for this. Let's eliminate this. Uh, also, I want to use this moment in time to also talk about we've learned a lot about this program, and I do think there will be other changes uh, that you will hear probably from other uh, speakers that they would like us to consider uh, as we go forward. They're not here in this bill, but uh, for example, right now uh, to uh, participate in this program, you have to be at 150% of the federal poverty line. Uh, there's a lot of people that are between that 150 and 200% that struggle. Uh, to meet their uh, needs, and you've, we've heard from the nonprofit community, we've heard from DTE and others who uh, implement this, that it might be time for us to take a look at extending this to a little larger uh, group of people. And so uh, we would hope that uh, we could have a conversation with this committee along with the Senate Energy Committee to see if we can make additional program uh, uh, advances on the MEAT program, but today we're just asking for the elimination of the uh, sunset uh, here. Uh, and obviously, we need to do this before the need of the sunset, which is in the early part of uh, the fall, and so the hope was to get this done uh, so we could be able to make sure everybody knows this program is moving forward and all the nonprofits who implement this on the behalf of the utilities and the Public Service Commission and DHHS are able to move this forward. So uh, thank you for your time uh, today, Madam Chair and members of the committee. Thank you. I'll open up to questions. Um, Representative Altman. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator, for being here. I um, was wondering if you would be open to not completely eliminating the sunset, maybe kicking the can down the road another decade or so, and then revisiting this at that point in time. Uh, I appreciate the uh, question, Representative. I, I think the fact that we've now had uh, three uh, cycles of, of, of implementation of this bill, I think when you hear from the utilities and others that have been participating in this, I think there's been universal support. And so at this point in time, I'd like us to kind of continue with the way the bill has been, okay. been drafted. I would encourage you to speak with the electric co-ops. Uh, they don't love this bill as much as our, our uh, investor public owned utilities here in the state of Michigan. Um, I've actually toyed around with sponsoring this bill, not eliminating the sunset, but you know, I think uh, extending it another five years. And I received uh, quite a quite a bit of pushback regarding that. So um, I would just encourage you to maybe speak to some of those other stakeholders and then uh, maybe follow up with a discussion. Sure, we'd we'll, we'll be pleased to do that. Uh, currently, right now, groups have to opt in. Uh, to this program uh, the way it's currently put in. So, for example, I live in the Lansing area. The Board of Water and Light, a municipal mm -hmm. uh, utility, has not been in the MEEP program. I think they're actually going to join for the first time uh, this year uh, for this upcoming winter season. So my understanding is that this program has not been mandated to co-ops uh, at this point in time. I know there's been conversations about expanding uh, to all uh, uh, utilities, but I don't believe it's, okay. it's happening is at that this point the, in time. You think that's the hesitancy, is that they were uh, fearful of expanding into their territory? Because uh, uh, I, I, I got pushback, like I said, from the um, 
the electric co-ops and also the munip- municipal electric uh, uh, groups as well. Yeah, like I said, I, 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 from my understanding, and I, there will be others who can maybe uh, correct me if I'm wrong, my understanding is groups have to opt in at this point in time. Uh, there have been conversations that maybe it should be everyone is, should be involved because it should be something that every uh, citizen has access to. Okay. Uh, but I think at this point in time, you still have to elect to, to join the program. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Chair Rep- recognizes Representative Hill. Thank you. Uh, I can speak as someone who is uh, served by a municipal utility who does not um, participate in many of these programs, and I don't have access, not that I need the low income, um, uh, but uh, there are rebate programs and other programs that are opt-in. Um, and uh, it does, I think, uh, leave certain residents without options. And in particular with this low-income program, um, the, you're, you're, you're in a crisis moment and you're needing support and help and um, having to go and ask uh, rather than having um, it be available and offered and knowing that the, no, there's that difference between knowing that the support is there when you're in that crisis moment versus having to go ask in a moment of great need. It can be very challenging, and I, um, I think it's very important that we continue to have the conversation about how to make sure that these programs are available to all of our uh, residents of Michigan, particularly rural residents who are often left out of, feel left out, and in this case, they truly are. Okay, rant over. Um, I um, want to ask, too, about the... Um, the Public Service Commission issues a report every year. Could you speak on how the Public Service Commission also maintains uh, some oversight over this program? You know, I, I do know that they, uh, every, you know, July, take a look at how they expand the program uh, into, the, into the following year. I've read their reports. Uh, I cannot, unfortunately, be able to share with you how they, they manage sort of the day-to-day beyond the reports that I've read. Uh, if there is uh, somebody here from the commission, I'm sure they would be able to, to help that, or we could maybe find some of that information out to you. But I don't know how they manage the oversight uh, beyond the reports that I've read. Thank you. Any further questions? I'm Representative Preston. Thank you. Um, just quickly, uh, your, your wish to extend this indefinitely, um, is it due to the, to the effectiveness of the current current state as it stands, or is there a wish on your part to expand its use in the future? Yeah, as I mentioned before, I, I, I would love to, to come back. I know we've had some conversations in the Senate committee. I'm sure maybe the chair and others have had some conversations. The one piece that I really want to take a look at is expanding this eventually from 150 percent of the federal poverty level to the 200 percent, because I think there are a lot of families that are being left out that probably need this level of assistance. So yeah, I would love to see some levels of expansion, but today the bill that's in front of us is just the elimination of that of that sunset. As someone that comes from the cooperative world, is it, are, are you committed to uh, leaving the cooperatives to, their, to themselves as far as their low-income energy assistance programs go? Well, I don't know where I stand specifically on that today, so I don't want to make any commitments. I know, for example, the, the Board of Water and Light, which again represents my community in East Lansing and Lansing, uh, we have been pushing them uh, to be involved. And like I said, they finally this year have said that they're going to sign up for this program. And, you know, my hope is that larger utilities, especially, and Board of Water and Light is one of the largest, you know, municipal utilities, that they should all have a piece of the pie. And so, uh, I would be willing to have a conversation with you as, as we go forward, but my hope is that more of people will be using this program and more utilities will be using this program. Thank you. Any more questions? No, that's it. Thank you very much for your testimony, Senator. Um, I do have uh, someone here from um, GTE who is the Vice President of Customer and Community Engagement, Yvette Griffey. Would you please join us at the table? Thank you. Good morning. Could you, could you push the button? Thank you. Good morning, Chairwoman Scott, Vice Chair Andrews, Vice Chair Wenzel, and members of the House Energy, Communications, and Technology Committee. My name is Yvette Griffey, and as she was stated, I'm the Vice, Co- Vice President of Customer and Community Engagement at DTE Energy. I want to thank you for the opportunity to come before you today to talk about our company's commitment to providing energy assistance to our most vulnerable customers. 
DTE has stood by its unwavering commitment to power homes, businesses with safe, reliable energy for over 100 years. We have a dedicated team of 10,000 employees who work hard every day to deliver on this commitment with an aspiration to be a force for good in the communities they live and serve in. Like many of you, it's that same dedication to my customers and our community that brings me before you today. Today I want to do three things. First, I want to illustrate the makeup of DTE's most vulnerable customer base. Second, I'll outline our commitment to these customers and the actions that we've taken so far. And finally, I want to discuss how together we can deliver more relief for much needed customers who need help. So let me start by setting the stage for what our income challenged population looks like at DTE. Like many of your districts, our service territory includes a diverse set of communities, ranging from urban centers to rural farmland, each with different socioeconomic backgrounds. As a result, our territory has a large income challenged population that requires energy assistance, a reality that was exacerbated by the COVID-19 pandemic and inflation. As a matter of fact, approximately one quarter of our three plus million customers are income challenged and struggle to meet afford and afford basic needs. We understand this reality and that's why affordability is a top priority for us. We remain deeply committed to providing energy assistance to any customer that needs help. Now to my second point, I want to highlight what we've done to provide support to our most vulnerable customers. We have long recognized the challenges that exist for these customers and are committed to mitigating these challenges through our partnerships with organizations like the Michigan Public Service Commission, the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services, organizations like THAW, the Heat and Warmth Fund, and many other faith-based and community organizations. By leveraging the federal, the federal Michigan's Low Income Home Energy Assistance Program, or LIHEAP as it's commonly referred to, during the pandemic, we proactively took steps to automatically apply energy assistance funding to customer accounts that qualified. In addition, Public Act 615, which created the Michigan Energy Assistance Program, paved the way for DTE's version of an affordable payment plan program called the Low, in Low Income Self-Sufficiency Program, or LSP for short. This program allows households to keep up with their energy bills through a fixed monthly payment plan that's based on their income and usage while providing a path to self-sufficiency. Today, that program has an 80% success rate. With enrollees completing their payment plan cycles and building a pattern of self-reliance. Which brings me to my final point, where I wanna to touch on how together we can deliver more for these customers. For several months now, we have been engaged with policymakers community leaders, and human service agencies to address the critical issue of energy assistance. As I mentioned, MEEP has been an instrumental tool in providing that assistance, and that's why we support Senate Bill 288, which seeks to reauthorize Public Act 615. However, the need for more energy assistance resources persists, not only for traditionally qualified customers, but also for the Alice Asset Limited income constrained and employed population who earn slightly more than the federal poverty level, but less than the basic cost of living. This leaves many in a catch-22 situation. Let me, let me introduce you to the Pearson family, a family of four making about $52,000 a year, which represents 200% of the federal poverty level. Debbie and Brian, along with their two children, have made Michigan their home. They are proud and hardworking residents who work very essential and yet low paying jobs. You see Debbie, Debbie works as a nurse at a local community clinic and Brian, well he's, he works at the local grocery store. They are hardworking residents, but like many in the Alice populations, they just don't, they, they, are, they make just enough to disqualify them from the many assistance programs that are offered, but not enough to cover the basic necessities of housing, childcare, food, transportation, and healthcare. The Pearsons face a choice no one should have to make, warming their homes for their children and providing meals and essential medicines for their family. For many of us, the Pearsons are our neighbors, our families, our friends, constituents. For me, these are my customers. Currently, MEEP assistance is capped at 150% of, of the federal poverty level, leaving a large portion of the vulnerable Alice population without resources for energy assistance. That's why we support legislation like Senate Bill 353. 
This bill will expand energy assistance requirements to include customers up to 200% of the federal poverty level and will provide needed assistance to this population. We look forward to having more discussions on the importance of this type of legislation. And while, this, while supporting this, these efforts are vital, we recognize that broader eligibility is only one piece of the puzzle. It is equally important to secure funding for energy assistance because without it, the reach of these programs will be limited. We've been collaborating with Senator Santana, Representative Morse, the Michigan Public Service Commission, and the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services to identify opportunities to appropriate funding to support expanding assistance to customers who fall within 200% of the federal poverty level. In closing, Madam Chairwoman, DTE is committed to serving our income challenge customers, and we have shown this commitment through our work with the state and community agencies over the years. However, there are limits to what we can do without further assistance. I want to thank you, Senator Sang, Senator Kleinfeld, Senator Santana, Representative Morse, and the entire legislative committee for your commitment and steadfast leadership. We stand as a partner and support Senate Bill 288 and legislation like Senate Bill 53. I welcome any questions. Thank you. Um, any questions? Oh, I'm sorry. Representative Hill or Burns. Which one? Go ahead. Okay, Representative Burns, please, if you have a question. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you for your testimony today. I really appreciate the conversation on affordability and accessibility. And on that note, can you talk to us about what DTE is doing to make its rates affordable overall, no matter what, for all of its customers? Yes, so we recognize that affordability is, is a top priority for us. Uh, a few th examples of what we are doing is we buy uh, gas and fuel when rates are low, store them. So right now we have enough fuel for our nuclear, for example, until 2028. That's something that we do to make sure that price fluctuations don't impact our customers. In addition, I know there's been a lot of talk about our upcoming rate increase. Well, our, we have not filed for a rate increase in over four years, and I think all of you can, can agree that there's been nothing that hasn't gone up over the last four years. We, haven't, we have not done a rate increase because we understood the impact the pandemic had on our customer base. So those are some examples of things, uh, I, but I can assure you that affordability is a top priority for us, and that's why we want to make sure that we also make, ensure that our customers have adequate access to resources that are going to help them. Thank you. Thank you. Chair recognizes Representative Churches. Thank you. Um, I, my question is similar to Representative Burns. Um, just thinking back to the ice storm that impacted our state, uh, some of my constituents faced like losing a lot of groceries and medicine, um, breast milk, things of that nature. Um, does DTE have a plan for if this happens again in the future? Um, so just like comparatively as constituents to a company, the amount of impact that had on the company, I know it was huge because everyone's concerned about people, right? So you're trying to help people, and, and I understand that. But um, the financial burden that that placed on our constituents is something that was really great. So what is um, the company willing to do to take a sacrifice in the future that would maybe be able to help those families get their groceries or get their medicine that might be thousands of dollars because I think that was just not equitable. So is there a plan to make sure that that doesn't happen? And if it does happen in the future, that the, the people can get some sort of help yes. to get through that? So I think the most sustainable and long-term solution is to make sure that we, we invest, make the necessary investments in the grid to reduce the number of outages that are happening. Uh, we have a plan. I think my CEO is coming before you in a couple of weeks to talk to you about that plan. Um, and I think what you'll hear is that our, we want to both reduce outage frequency as well as duration so that the outages aren't as long as they have been. Um, but we absolutely recognize the burden that this places on our customers. We do a lot in, uh, to, try to try to avoid this happening at all. Uh, some of the things that we do in addition to uh, just kind of trying to avoid outages is making sure that we are present in the community. So we open warming centers. We uh, make sure that folks, I have a team of, of folks who are calling 
a group of senior citizens across our territory to make sure that they have access to their medicines and medications. And so we do a lot on the ground in the communities that we serve to make sure that customers are, are protected. Um, obviously, we need to do more. Um, I think there's a, there's a, we, what, we have a credit that we offer, which I know is not enough to cover a lot of the, our customers' needs. Um, but I will say that it is the most aggressive in the country. Um, and we're open to talking about policies and things we can do to, to make this better uh, for our customers. I think you'll hear uh, from some of my colleagues on some of that in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and also in the future, we want to keep our questions germane to the bill that we're speaking about today. But thank you. Thank you, thank you so much for your testimony. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Okay, I'm going to read in cards of uh, people that are opposing but not here to speak on it. We have Jason Hayes from the Mackinac Center for Public Policy. We also... Oh, he's on, not in support. Okay. Um, we have Rika Holly Volker, who is in support of the bill from Michigan Public Service Commission. We have uh, Dan Dudas, who is in support of the bill from Michigan Electric and Gas Association. We have Julie Cassidy, who is in support of the bill from Michigan League for Public Policy. Logan Vorse, who is in support of the bill from Michigan League of Conservation Voters. Wendy Randall, who is in support of the bill from the Coalition to Keep Michigan Warm. Mike O'Brien, who is in support of the bill from Indiana Michigan Power Company. Bethany Stoltzman, who is in support of the bill from the United Way. From United Way. <laughs> South Central Michigan. Um, we have Tim Lubis, or Lubers, who is in support of the bill from SEMCO. Carly Knott, who is in support of the bill from Michigan Environmental Council. Kyle McCree, who is in support of the bill from Consumers Energy. Maureen Watson Badger, who is in support of the bill from Salvation Army. And Santil Jenkins, CEO of Thaw, uh, who is also in support of the bill. Okay. We have no absent members today, um, so no more business before the committee. So I move to adjourn uh, the Energy Communications and Technology Committee. Thank you.